Hello, uh, my name is Ricardo Kohler. I'm a researcher at IBM, uh, TJ Watson Lab. And today I'll be talking about virtualization, VMs and VM monitors, and why are these getting more smaller and uh, lightweight. Um, then I'll talk about what's the, what I believe is the, the logical next step, which is getting uh, VMs even smaller and monitors even tinier to the extreme to not having one monitor at all. I'll talk about a prototype of such a such an idea called uh, Nabla Linux, and I'll talk a bit about how would that look like, and some some results, some performance numbers, and some isolation uh, uh, analysis. So this this whole idea of sorry. Um, so this whole idea of having um, of having VMs uh, being smaller comes from from containers. So the thing is that containers are are great for development, and uh, have really good lightweight performance characteristics. Like they can boot uh, very fast. They have very low memory overhead, and there is a, a lot of uh, tooling and orchestration built around containers, like uh, Kubernetes, Istio. Uh, also, containers are really good for things like sharing. Uh, files, for example, and even things like sharing TCP IP stacks between containers, which are hard to do with VMs, for example. Um, but um, containers are not so great in terms of uh, isolation. So that makes them not ideal as, uh, as cloud, units of cloud units of execution. And the, the reason is, is has, it can be seen on the, on the figure on the right. Thing is that in, in the cloud, you have machines running containers from different tenants where a malicious tenant can have access to the host kernel via some attack on the host kernel and then gain control of the kernel and the whole machine because this host kernel is, is privileged and then access the, some secret from a, from a co-located container, for example. Now, the reason why that's easier to do in a container is because a container uh, access the host kernel via a very large attack surface. The, the host kernel provides this container processes with a very large set of uh, system calls, pretty much all the system calls available in Linux, which are almost 300. Um, and, and that's because the, a container relies on a very high level uh, of abstraction. As compared to a VM, which uh, uses a lower level of abstraction, relies on a, on a virtual machine abstraction, which needs a narrower and smaller uh, set of APIs from the host kernel. So in a way, this is a smaller attack surface to the kernel. And that makes uh, VMs, um, so that makes malicious VMs uh, harder to attack host kernels and then gain access to the machines. So because of that, um, VMs are being used uh, as uh, the units of uh, isolation in, in clouds. And projects like Kata containers use them, uh, for example, the Kata use them by uh, having a container, a container per VM or a container or a part of containers per VM. The issue though is that containers, uh, sorry, uh, VMMs and VMs are, are kind of uh, bloated. Um, VMMs in particular, which, which uh, are the, the pieces in the stack that emulate the, the machine and all the devices that the machine need, have traditionally been emulating way too much and doing way too much, more than needed in the cloud, for example. Um, they emulate a lot of devices, uh, which not everybody need. And they even emulate uh, multiple architectures or instruction sets that uh, are more complicated than needed. Um, for example, a VMM, uh, like, like an older QMU, will be, with, with all the features, will be able to emulate something like a floppy and even being able to run something like MS-DOS, which is definitely too much for the cloud. So there has been a movement towards having a smaller and more lightweight VMs. If that means uh, thinning the, the guests and the monitors. So on the guest side, um, there has been a, an effort to, to, to make uh, user spaces smaller, for example, with Alpine Linux. On the guest kernel side, there are uh, configurations for the kernel, for example, the, the one from the, um, uh, the micro VM one from the Firecracker project, or even extreme cases like unikernels, which are VMs built to only run one specific uh, application, and they include nothing more than what's needed. On the monitor side, 
uh, there are projects like uh, Firecracker or uh, unicornal monitors like Solo 5 HVT, which uh, specialize for some specific cases and only include what's needed, nothing more, uh, making them as, as smaller as possible. Um, by doing this, uh, you get these micro VMs and, and you get lots of benefits. For example, you get a smaller attack surface to the host. You have good performance, uh, lower memory overheads. Uh, you're able to boot much faster than a traditional VM. Uh, and because everything is simpler overall, you have less code and it's cheaper to, to audit the whole thing for security. Now, as an example, we have a firecracker, which is the state of the art. And this is a monitor in the KVM stack uh, written in Rust in a safe language, uh, specialized for serverless workloads and containers. And by specializing for these particular workloads, it, it can make some assumptions and, 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 and it has a very reduced device model. It only emulates a very small set of devices and make things like uh, not having PCI or not have a BIOS. And by doing these things, it's able to boot really fast in 125 milliseconds and has very low memory overhead, uh, five megabytes in the case of Firecracker, which is, which is great. So why is that not enough? Actually, actually that's, that's great. That's enough for most cases. But uh, I, I've been thinking about it. Like, can, can we do better? Do we really need to run everything as traditional VMs? Meaning that, you know, you have KVM and you have a monitor. Couldn't you use, for some types of workloads, couldn't you go with just not having a monitor? Something like, like this in the figure. Um, I mean, at the very least, the design on the left, I'm sorry, the design on the right would be much simpler because you won't be using the VMM. So you have one extra component in the stack less. And also because you're not using virtualization in traditional sense, you wouldn't be using KVM. And in cases where you don't have things like uh, hardware support for virtualization, where you don't have, um, I don't know, support for extended page tables, uh, this KVM piece gets really, really complex. So not having to use it makes things simpler overall. And even in the case where you do have hardware virtualization support, the, the hardware uh, features just to support that, it should be accounted as complexity as well. So at the very least, this thing on the right should be simpler. And even maybe faster, we'll see later. Um, for example, in terms of latency, system calls should be uh, system calls that do IO should be should have lower latency because they have to go through less steps in the stack. Um, so now we're gonna see uh, how, how you do that, right? I mean, the first thing that, that we need to think about is that um, this VMM was doing was doing something was doing a lot of work actually. So now that you don't have one. You need the kernel, for example, the guest kernel, to be doing its job. Um, so let's say we wanted to have this thing on the right running as a VM, a VM as a single process, let's say. Even if you have multiple guest processes, you want it to run somehow as a single process running on top of a low level uh, of abstraction, meaning on a very small subset of all the system calls available. So ideally, we want a VM running as one process on a small set of system calls. Right? And we need to be able to do whatever the VMM was doing. So let's take a look at what the VMM was doing. Basically, the VMM emulates a machine, right? It emulates virtual devices, uh, CPUs, it emulates a virtual MMU, and, and very importantly, it protects the host. And this is important because that's the reason why we're interested in VMs for the case of containers, right? Is the, the protection part. So virtual devices. Um, this VMM uh, emulates, uh, for example, disks, actual disks, which are consumed over a bus, for example. Uh, and these disks are emulated using some underlying under, uh, resource in the host. For example, uh, a file in the host. Or it could emulate a network card um, on top of a, of a raw socket on the host. That, that's, what the, that's one of the jobs of the VMM. Another uh, job of a VMM is to emulate uh, virtual CPUs. That means one or more CPUs um, with the complete instruction set of the machine, of the host machine, right? Uh, 
Um, and that, that, that could mean, for example, having to emulate two vCPUs when the machine, the physical machine only has one physical CPU. The VMM is able to emulate that. Another uh, job for the VMM is to, to emulate uh, an MMU. Now, an MMU allows the guest to implement virtual memory. It makes it possible to have multiple processes with different address spaces in the VM and protection between address spaces and even having different layer, different levels of privileges, for example. It, it makes it possible for the guest to have uh, a kernel with pages only accessible by the kernel or having pages only accessible by processes and not the other processes. Also makes it possible to map uh, pages between between processes, mapping the actual same physical page with, between two or more processes. And all of that is controlled by the VM via uh, a page table and, and some registers accesses. Um, so the VMs running on top of this VMM are expected to to handle these virtual memory configurations by writing into memory and writing some values into inter-registers. Uh, and that's one of the, one, another job of the VMA, right? Um, finally, the, the one, another, and one of the final jobs that I'm listing here for, 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 a, v, for a typical VMM is to protect the host. Um, so the way it does that is by first uh, limiting what the instructions running in, running in the VM can do. That in a way limits what, what type of access will the VM have with regards to the, to the whole physical machine. Um, and the second thing is that the VM, the VM does IO, for example, by indirectly talking to the VMM and in a way, it has, a, it has certain control of the VMM. So it's important to also uh, limit what the VMM can do. Um, so the, the typical way that VMMs do it, for example, QMU or Firecracker, is by implementing a sandbox. Um, so that's uh, like a white list of system calls, a list that only includes the system calls of, uh, that the, that the VMM process can do at runtime. And that means that, for example, um, a VMM shouldn't be able to open any random file in the, in the file system of the host. Uh, in particular, if the VMM is already running and it's, uh, it's using some, some file as a disk and some tab device, it, it has enough file descriptors and resources to do its job. It shouldn't have to open anything else. So, so the, the way to, to sandboxes is to, to not allow these VMM process to make that particular open call. Another reason is that you could have the VM, a uh, malicious VM, escape the instruction box, right, and, and get access to the VMM. So you want to, to limit what these attacker running as the VMM would do as well. Another um, important point to notice is that this sandbox, this list of system calls that the VMM is allowed to do is, is not only um, small, but it's also bounded. Uh, meaning that whatever uh, application, whatever workload you run in the VM, the VMM will never have to do more than those particular system calls that you have in your sandbox. And that's different in the case of a regular process or a container which is, where it's very hard to, to define uh, ahead of time what are the system calls that some application would need, right? As an example, an extreme example, let's say the application is Python, right? So the application could just uh, import the OS module and call OS whatever system call it wants to make, right? It could literally make any one of the 300 system calls that, that, that you have available in Linux kernel. But at the same time, you have, if you have that application running on the left as a VM, it can do whatever combinations of system calls it wants, but the VMM will never, never, ever make more than the system calls allowed in the sandbox. And uh, that, that's great. That's a great reason for why we use VMs as, a, as an isolation boundary as compared to our process. I think that is the reason, the main reason. Um, so, so we just saw, we just, we just discussed um, 
what's the role of a VMM, what is doing in the Intel virtualization stack, so we can remove it and have some other component do the same, do the same, uh, uh, have the same job, right? So specifically, we talked about all these four uh, tasks, uh, virtualizing devices, CPUs, MMUs, and protecting the host. And we want to not have a VMM. So we basically want to have a kernel running as a process now, do all of these ones, right? So it turns out that doing the three, the, I mean, doing the jobs with, a, with, a, with an okay uh, symbol there, like virtualizing devices, CPUs, and protecting the host, it's, it's completely doable, right? Uh, on the other hand, virtualizing an MMU, that's, that's hard. Actually, I, I don't know how could you possibly have um, a process providing uh, a virtual memory abstraction to to itself in a way, right? I mean, the only way would be to have full emulation. You could have QMU, for example, with full emulation and, and pretty much emulate whatever you want, including an MMU. Um, but I was thinking about it, and I, I think, I think uh, one way to go about it is to not have an MMU. And, and we'll see that that, although in, it, it sounds crazy because not having an MMU could mean not having processes, uh, seems too much, but as you will see, it, it's actually enough to run a, a lot of stuff, even processes in some way. So the way to go about it is by using uh, two known features of the Linux, Linux kernel. Uh, the first one is the uh, UML, uh, User Mode Linux, which makes it possible to run uh, a Linux uh, kernel in user space as a process. And the other one is the no MMU config option, for the Linux kernel, which uh, makes it possible to run the Linux kernel on devices with no MMUs. So let's first talk about no MMU. So, I, so I don't know if you guys remember the iPod. Um, so we had, um, sorry guys and girls. So we have, uh, we, I mean, there was this thing called the iPod, I guess nobody's using it anymore, which was, uh, at the time, it didn't run Linux, but now it turns out that it can actually run Linux, even though it didn't. It was a very simple device that even ha it didn't have an MMU, or didn't have a. I mean, it had a very simple MMU, but it's possible to run Linux on one of these things, which is which is pretty amazing. And uh, the the way uh, it's it's do is done is by using this config option in the kernel called config MMU. So you just say no, and that's it. And I mean, from the user point of view, it's very simple, right? But uh, it, I, actually what happens uh, behind it, it, it it's, it's very clever and it is very neat. Um, so this is an idea on the right of what, what's happening, right? So you have one single um, address space and remember there is no virtual memory. So there is just one linear address space, which is the same for every single process in the kernel. And there is no protection. Every process can see everything, can touch everything. Um, and every address will be the same for everybody in this machine. But even if you have that, it's possible to run multiple processes. And the way uh, it's done is by using processes with code built as uh, position independent binaries. Uh, typically, binaries are built with hard coded addresses. Uh, and they're asked, I mean, they ask via ELF uh, files that to be loaded at specific uh, locations and off, sorry, offsets in, in the virtual address of a process. But for security reasons, people have, uh, I mean, um, Linux developers have uh, developed these uh, other type of binaries called uh, PI, position independent. And the idea is that now this code for different processes can be loaded anywhere in memory. Which, and again, that was done for security purposes, but it's very convenient for something like a device with no MMU because now you can load, for example, these, these binary, these green binary or the orange binary, whatever you want in the address space, which again is just a single one, and just run it. And run it means you give it a you give it a stack, you give it some memory for a heap, and the thing should just run. Uh, and actually it does run. Um, so that was the first feature, right? The second feature, it's uh it's called UML. It's a uh, user mode Linux uh, 
and, and it's really not, not exactly a feature. It's, it's, uh, from the Linux kernel point of view, it's, it's an arch. So you can build a kernel with arch equal a um, and it will build an executable, typically VM Linux, which is a regular executable in Linux that you can run as a process. So it's a re like a regular in every sense, like it has a main and you can run it like any other process. And the difference though, I mean, it's a special process because it's actually the Linux kernel running. Um, and, and it does some, some interesting things. For example, whenever you start a new process in UML, this UML kernel process will fork, literally fork from the point of view of the host, a new process and uh, control it via ptrace. And so what happens is that whenever these, these uh, user level process, user level from the point of view of the, of the UML VM, uh, does a system call, um, the system call is trapped and the UML kernel gets controlled, so you can implement the system call and then return back to the guest, to the guest process, for, again, from the point of view of UML. Um, now, you, you might be thinking, this, is, this should be enough, just not even considering no MMU, just, just UML it's, uh, should be enough as what we were looking for, which is uh, a virtual machine running in user space without using uh, Without um, without using a monitor, in a way, this is what we want, but not not really because if for for security reasons we said that we want a type of VM with a low level of abstraction, uh, accessing a low level of abstraction in a very uh, narrow attack surface to the host, and. I don't consider fork to be low level enough. So this doesn't really feel like a, like a virtual machine in that sense. A fork operation is not a machine operation. A machine operation is something like write a packet on a, on a network card or uh, write a block uh, on a block device. But really that's, um, I mean, really that's debatable, right? Uh, another reason is that, uh, the cost of doing a ptrace is, is just too high. Um, and and just, ju just, just, just in case, there, is, there are other projects that do something very similar. For example, GVisor does a similar, um, has a similar architecture. Uh, also ptracing uh, fork processes and things like that. The only difference is, is that instead of using the UML kernel, they use their own version of a, of a safer kernel written in Go but they, they have the same issue with Petris. And, and just in case, there is another version of GVisor that uses a, a virtual machine abstraction, a virtual machine um, boundary as the mechanism to trap into system calls and, and have the kernel implement the system calls. Um, but I, I won't go into that in this presentation. So again, what we want is a mix of a UML and no MMU. And we really want a single process running on a low uh, level of abstraction, doing very few system calls like here, and, and, and a VM capable of doing useful stuff, and for example, being able to run multiple processes. So, um, so again, the idea is that we will use UML to implement these drivers and implement uh, these network operations, and we'll use no MMU as a way of having multiple processes running on a single address space, a thing in the feed. Now, if you do this, most of the implementation is already there. For example, UML takes care of uh, the part of how running the kernel as a single process, so sorry, as a process. So UML, uh, I mean, ArchUM, all that piece of code in the Linux kernel already knows how to, already defines a main, already knows how to start uh, start the whole thing, start the kernel. It, it's, uh, it has code to handle kernel threads. And just in case, these are green threads, pure green threads. Uh, so that means that um, although you have a single process, a single UML process, uh, you have multiple kernel threads running in this single process. And it's, it's basically code, long jumping between pieces of code. And that's different from a different type of training, which would be something, for example, that you, do, you would do with ptrades, uh, where a ptrade maps to a kernel trade in the host. 
Uh, UML is not doing that. UML is, again, it's a single process, single thread of execution, just happens to implement threading in user level. Um, now, all that is already implemented in UML. UML also implements uh, devices. For example, there is a UML disk, uh, which uh, can be uh, using, uh, you know, a file on the on the host. So you, can, you can say you can define a QCAL2 as a regular machine, regular virtual machine to use to be used as a disk for UML or a tab device or a raw socket. Um, yeah, that, that that's all done on the UML side. And from the from the NoMMU side, we get uh, memory management. We get the MM for NoMMU. And that's that's important for things like uh, MMAPs, for example. We need a way to do MMAPs without an MMU. Uh, and, and just in case, these are not all possible types of MMAPs. Uh, for example, uh, um, the MM, no MMU version is not able to do M maps at fixed locations um, because that, that will be tricky because you only have one address space and there is no way to ensure that uh, different uh, different uh, process won't try to M map the same location. So the, the way to fix it is to not allow it, not, not even implement it. Um, but there's some some stuff that is not implemented by using uh, UML and NoMMU to, to have these crazy things that, that I've been describing. For example, uh, all the process creation and management in UML, it's, it's using fork and ptrace. We, we don't want that part. Also, uh, it's using, um, it assumes that, uh, that the, um, the, the transition from user to kernel space, typically a system call, is is uh, is, is done via ptrace. We we cannot do that anymore because we don't even have ptrace, right? Uh, also, another thing that needs to be needed to be do, needed to be done is that uh, loading an elf typically use memory maps. I uh, mean that same the same page, same physical page corresponding to a to a file to an executable file is mapped to multiple processes. And uh, now we don't have an MMU, so we cannot map to, to anything really. Um, so the elf loading part had to be adapted for, for a no MMU case. And on the user space, uh, the, the, although we wanted to go with minimal changes, you need, you need some change. I need, at least you need to rebuild some stuff. For example, uh, libc needs to be adapted to use a different mechanism than just doing syscall instructions in the case of x86. Uh, things like busybox also needed to be changed and, and we're gonna see these ones in more detail in a bit. So the first the first point, uh, so again, UML handled processes uh, by forking in the host and then p-tracing these processes, right? I mean, we, we don't want these because again, I consider these to be too high level, it's not VM-like. Um, so we wanted to have something like, like this on the right. So now that we're on the right, we're running everything on the same process. We don't have, we don't have an idea of a kernel user level privilege. So everything is a function call, right? So the way that user calls the kernel is by a function call. So the question is where does it get the address for that function call or how does it call it. Um, turns out that that problem is already solved. So in so the kernel implements, uh, well, I mean, used to implement this thing called BC call and more recently BDSO, which allows the kernel to define a mechanism for which the user space, most likely libc is going to call the kernel. And that's used for some system calls like uh, get time of day, which should be really fast. So it's a, it's a way for the kernel to tell user space, uh, a user space, don't, don't do a regular system call instructions in the case of get time of day, just, just use this other mechanism, which in the case of VDSO, it's a way of, um, of really having the user space uh, run kernel code in a kind of a safe way. Uh, we can use that mechanism to tell in UML, in this modified version of UML, to tell user space, uh, you know, this orange uh, program there, to, to call us by some specific mechanism, which in this case would be just a regular function call. Um, and again, that mechanism already exists. 
but is not used by default for every system call in, in libc. So libc only makes this check of, uh, is it implement so is, is there a VDSO version of this function of the system call for some system calls only, for example, get time update. So that the, the, like, let's say the, the, the adaptation in this case to make this proof of concept was to, to have that mechanism apply to every system call. So for every system call, uh, libc should ask, is there a different way? Kernel, tell me. And the kernel will say, yes, uh, you should make this function call. Um, so, so yeah, these, these libc changes is what, is what I just described. Plus there's some other extra things. For example, libc knows how to, to malloc memory, but in malloc could be implemented with mmaps. And in this case, mmap is, is not, I mean, it's the same mmap calls, but not all the mmap, not the, not all the available flags are available for a libc with no MMU. Uh, oh, but nicely enough, this, at least this first thing, it's already implemented in muscle. So you can build muscle, muscle libc with no MMU. And it just, just works. You just needed to be changed a bit to have, this is called uh, the default for every system call. Um, but changing libc is not enough. You also need to change applications. For example, uh, you need to change, uh, in this case, if you want a shell or, and, and you know, command line applications, you need to, I mean, the easiest way to go and change BusyBox and to build it with no MMU. And also, amazingly, that also already exists. You can build BusyBox with config no MMU uh, and it just works. And it does the following two things, most importantly, it, it removes a dependency for some operations on MAPs at fixed locations. And most importantly, it replaces forks and execs with uh, v forks and xx and I'll go over that next uh, because because it's quite interesting. So forks and xx. So fork and exec is a traditional way by which something like a shell will spawn a new process and a new executable. Really. So what happens is that you have a parent process or process that calls fork and fork creates an extra process, a child. And the, the rule is that the child process and the fork process uh, have the same memory, exactly the same memory, but the child has a copy. Um, instead of actually doing a copy, um, modern operating systems implement fork by uh, having memory copy and write. So that means that it's, it's, it's a lazy copy in a way, right? Um, I'm sure you all know this already, but you'll see why this is relevant in a minute. Now, what happens is that uh, if you have fork and exec, immediately after doing a fork, uh, the child will go and exec, so we will load another executable and just, just run it. And at that point, these mappings that you have for the cow, for example, uh, are not used anymore. So this child, now in green, is using its own version of memory for everything. It has its own heap, its own everything. Nothing is marked copy and write, I mean, by default. Uh, in the case of uh, fork alone, this is used, for example, for things like um, having worker processes all, all starting from the same memory. Um, so as you, will, as you will see, this is problematic for the cases where you don't have an MMU because copy and write can only be done if you have virtual memory. Um, I mean, copy and write really means mapping pages to the same thing and having one mark read only and things like that. Um, without an MMU, you, there is no concept of virtual memory so or mapping or, or none of that. So you cannot really implement these with no MMU. So the way that it's fixed, I mean, it's not really fixed, the way that it's, yeah, it's fixed in BusyBox, for example, is not BusyBox in no MMU mode, Whenever it does a uh, fork and exec, uh, I mean, this configuration makes it use a v fork instead. And v fork, it's, it's not a made up uh, function, uh, system called just in case, it is, uh, has a particular historical use, but now it happens to be very convenient for non new devices. And think of it as a fork with slightly different rules. So the rules for a v fork are that 
when a process beforks another process, the parent process blocks, means that it does nothing, it's just here blocked on the vfork until the child execs or exits. Um, and now that's super convenient because that means that if the, for example, the shell in BusyBox uh, happens to start another shell, for example, you don't have this issue of needing to mark things copy and write because there is no, there is no moment in time where you have the parent and the child needing to access the same uh, pages as, as, as copy and write. There is no need for that. So it's safe. Um, on the other hand, a, a fork alone, it's, it's, not, it's not implementable. Um, so one way is to replace it with, with a V fork. Another way is just, just keep a fork, but it's, it's, it's a special type of fork because now things are not ex necessarily copy and write, things will be literally the same pages. So meaning that if a child writes a page, the parent will see that change. So that's not what you would expect on a fork. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's what uh, BusyBox with no MMU does. And again, that's not something I did, it's there already for most likely for devices that do not have an MMU. Now, let's see an example of how this uh, proof of concept uh, works. So, just in case, I, I don't have a clear idea of how this thing will be consumed, but this is how I've been using it and how I ran the experiments that I'm gonna show you later. So, you can take a, an Alpine Docker image, and this Alpine Docker image could have things installed. For example, it could have Python, uh, Node, I don't know, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but it comes by default with a muscle libc, just a file, and a busy box, which is also nicely just a file. So the way I've been, you know, transforming this Docker image to be consumed by this UML VM, I mean, because really it's just like a modified UML. And just as any VM, uh, it doesn't know how to consume a Docker image, it knows how to consume a disk. So you have to make a disk for it. Um, so the, the process I've been using is to replace libc and busybox with, with our own version of muscle, libc and busybox, and create a disk. In this case, I've been creating xt4 on qcal2. So you do that, and now you can run it as a VM. Um, now, why Alpine? The, the reason is that, uh, again, we need to have position independent executables, Py executables. And Alpine, one of the Alpine goals, as mentioned here, is to be secure. And it turns out that, uh, again, I mean, Py executables are nice because they make things more secure. Uh, really, they make uh, the attacker's job harder. But anyway, the, the point is that Alpine, one of the goals is to have everything as Py executables. And that's actually kind of true. Not, not everything is Py, but most things are Py. Um, and the other reason is that Alpine uses Muscle and BusyBox. Um, I, I could have used glibc, um, but, but in this case, BusyBox, I mean, it, it, it's perfect. It, it makes things very simple because it means that you need to just replace one file. And also BusyBox already has an option for be built with no MMU, which is really convenient. So if you build one of these things and you run it, this is how you would run it. Actually, actually, you will be able to run it. Uh, I, I have a link at the end. So in this case, I'm running on a host, and just in case I'm printing the kernel version, which is a 415, and then you run this, this VM, which again can be seen as a regular VM. Uh, this is not much different to the way in which you will run a QMU VM. And also, if you know about UML, it's exactly the same invocation that you would use for UML. Now you run this thing and you will immediately get a shell. Uh, in this case, I'm using a particular type of init, which is basically starting a shell, uh, being sh. And then from there, if you do, if you print the kernel version, you will see that it's a different kernel version. Again, it's, it's really a VM in a way, right? Um, if you go there and you do a top, you will see that it's running, a, in this case, it's running just two processes, my shell that started top and a bunch of path kernel threads. And the best part is that all of this stuff is running as a single, as one 
uh, host process. From the point of view of the host, this is one process. And again, just to be clear, there is no KVM, there is no hardware virtualization support, support of any kind, there is no monitor, it's just, it's just a modified UML process that is doing just these system calls on the right. So it has system calls, for example, write and read to, I don't know, read and write console, a block device, um, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, nano sleep, so it can implement, uh, you know, timers, um, timer set time. Um, uh, by the way, I, I don't have much time to go into this one, but um, um, timer interrupts in UML are implemented as, as timer signals. So actual timer signals are mapped into timer interrupts, which are forward in a way to the Linux scheduler, the regular Linux scheduler to, to preempt uh, processes and in, in run as regular. So this is a preemptable kernel, just in case. And I, I, again, in that particular case, I didn't implement anything. Everything is already done for, for UML. Um, just, just to compare, if you were to do something, oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention, in this case, these system calls, uh, this S trace result is, is, was gathered after uh, running a bunch of stuff. Uh, I ran Python, GNU plot, I formatted a bunch of disks, I ran Node, Nginx, a bunch of stuff. And again, whatever you do, it will never be more than these system calls, which, which, is, which is really nice. It, it's the same property that we saw for a, that happens for a regular VMM. Now, just to compare, if you were to do a hello world in Python, these are all the system calls that this process would do. And, and just in case, if you just change the version from three to two, it's a different type. If a diff, it's a different set of system calls. So that, that, that's to show how many system, how, how high level and how many system calls does the kernel need to provide for something like a process in just a hello world. Um, just in case, I mean, there are lots, lots of limitations, right? Uh, although you can run Python, which is awesome, at least for me, uh, there is a lot of stuff not implemented in this VM, right? First of all, you don't have virtual memory. You don't have memory protection. So everybody running in this VM sees everybody's memory. So it makes it much easier to just crash the whole VM. Um, so it's easy to crash the host VM the whole VM. For example, a null pointer exception will crash the whole VM, which uh, when you run on a regular Linux box, it just crashes up the process, right? Uh, also, you don't have forks. So just to be clear, that means that if you, for example, go into Python and do an OS fork, that fails with an error. In this case, it fails with an invalid argument error. And again, it can only run Py executables, and you need to use a modified libc. And turns out that the Py executable thing, it, it's kind of a pain. I've uh, been trying to run TensorFlow and PyTorch, and because of uh, not being Py, it, I, I was unable to do so. Uh, also, just just the fact that I'm basing, I, I use Muscle also makes some stuff harder. Uh, for example, I wasn't able to run PyTorch, and that's not even considering this new type of VM that I'm talking about. It's just being able to run on Alpine. Um, yeah. So super quickly, uh, some performance numbers. So one of the things that this uh, thing is good at is to boot fast. So. Uh, on the left, we have Firecracker with the micro VM configuration. And although in the paper, they, the Firecracker paper from NSD, I mentioned that they can boot in 125 milliseconds, I was able to boot in less than 60 milliseconds, uh, which is great. Uh, but Nabla Linux, this thing is able to boot even faster. It boots in less than 10 milliseconds, eight milliseconds to be correct, which, which is great. Now, this slide over here is just to show uh, system call latency. And it's just to show that uh, just because you're removing one layer, it doesn't necessarily mean that latency is gonna be better. So it's better in just the system calls in the middle. Some stuff like selects on a bunch of file descriptors or forking lots of times is not necessarily faster. So this is just to show that uh, 
this is not necessarily better in every case for something like system call latency. And finally, uh, Nginx throughput, this is just application throughput that I want to measure with IO, uh, and I compared against Firecracker. And interestingly, it's exactly the same as Firecracker. And that, that's, that's expected because although Firecracker is using a VM and it has VertIO in the middle, uh, maybe latency is higher, but because VertIO is batching a bunch of packets, uh, at the end, it doesn't make any difference, right? So just to, to finish, uh, what's next? So there are a couple of things I wanted to get out of this presentation. So first of all, see an interesting trade-off for, for anybody. Um, more specifically, I mean, this, this weird thing that I'm proposing um, gets you some stuff. For example, simplicity, it's much simpler because you don't have one of the components like the VMM or KVM. It boots fast and could help with some specific cases like, let's say, nested. In this case, you would be able to nest, I don't know, as many times as you want. Um, but all that uh, is in exchange for generality. You cannot run anything. You cannot run any binary or any container. Um, so again, is this a trade-off that people might be interested in? And, and finally, if the answer is yes, what is the best way of consuming this? Um, because again, I've been doing this crazy hack of just replacing a file and just crossing my fingers that things will run at, after this, right? I mean, doesn't seem ideal. Um, so that's something that I wanted to, to discuss, hopefully, as well. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll be taking some questions. And just in case, uh, here's the link for the, for the repo with all of this. Thank you very much.